Hi, everyone, and welcome. I am Avi Savar. I'm the president of Suzy, and I am thrilled to welcome everyone today to our inaugural State of the Consumer Summit. We have a jam-packed session today and very excited to host all of our guests from brands like Mondelez, from brands like PepsiCo, from brands like Unilever, tons of incredible guests, and we are excited to kick things off uh, with our State of the Consumer Summit. For those of you that don't know, over the past nine months, um, we have produced countless State of the Consumer presentations, reports, and articles on topics ranging from the future of home, shifting e-commerce trends, tentpole holidays, and more. Obviously, in the last nine months, there's been such a dramatic shift in the way consumers interact with the world around them. And uh, as a brand who's dedicated to enabling human understanding, we look at it as our responsibility to bring this content to you. I encourage everyone to visit our resource center at suzy.com to sign up for our newsletter and explore all the research we published and will continue to publish. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, Suzy is a real-time consumer insights platform. Our software is powered by an integrated and on-demand consumer network of screened and verified consumers, which allows you to get trusted insights in minutes. We work with some of the biggest brands in the world, insights teams, marketing teams, and innovations teams. They all use Suzy to power data-driven decisions across the enterprise. Uh, before we get into today's agenda, I did want to make a uh, pretty exciting announcement at least exciting from a Suzy perspective, we are thrilled to announce our newest product today. Going live today, Suzy Live. Suzy Live is a video-based qualitative research platform that allows brands to conduct in-person, in-depth consumer, consumer interviews in a snap. Suzy Live brings together quality, speed, and ease of use that our customers have come to expect with the ability to talk one-on-one -on -one with our screened and verified audience. With built-in scheduling, moderation, transcription, and more, listening to the voice of you, your consumer has never been easier. If you're interested in learning more about Suzy Live or our core Suzy Insights platform, please visit suzy.com and request a demo. We have such a great agenda packed for you today, so let's get into it. Our schedule includes a keynote from my partner in crime and Suzy's founder, CEO, Matt Britton along with panel discussions featuring experts from Mondelez and Pepsi, Microsoft and Unilever, and our very own head of market research, Will Siramosa, is going to deep dive into how you can bridge qualitative and quantitative research to better understand your consumer. Also, please make sure to join us live on Twitter using hashtag uh, SOC. And um, make sure you join the conversation because we'll be giving away uh, some fun prizes throughout the day. Uh, without further ado, I'm super excited to introduce my partner in crime, uh, Matt Britton. He's a successful serial entrepreneur. He's an author pre-pandemic. He traveled the world to speak to packed crowds, and he just so happens to be our CEO. So without further ado, I am pleased to announce Matt Britton with the State of the Consumer 2021. I'm Matt Britton. Matt Britton. Matt Britton. I'm the founder and CEO of Suzy. Thank you for joining our third, our fifth. This is now our 13th State of Consumer webinar. Today, we are going to be talking about the U.S. consumer, the future of cities, the e-commerce shopping revolution. And then we have a special guest, Lindsay Mather, Crystal Lindell, Kristen Musilin. There's the shift in the economic climate. Uh, a lot of people have had to think on their feet this year. People are taking their time getting back into the swing of things. It's been a real thrill for us to be able to partner with you guys on this. And until next time, ask Susie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Avi, for the warm introduction. Um, what a year it's been, right? It's uh, March seems like yesterday and March seems like decades ago. And I can't believe we were still here, um, almost in November, still quarantined, uh, still working remotely. Uh, this would normally be a day where I'd be um, in a room with hundreds of people or, th or thousands of people getting ready for a big presentation, feeling the energy, feeling the crowd. And now instead, I am staring at a monitor and a big ring light. 
But you know, you try to make uh, lemonade out of lemons and that's what we try to do at Suzy. Um, before we start, I just wanna thank um, all of our 100 plus employees at Suzy for all the hard work that they've done this year. I know um, our team, like so many teams around the country, have really struggled to um, work in a remote environment without the camaraderie and teamwork of being in an office. But I couldn't be more proud of our team at Suzy and what they've accomplished and what we have um, ahead of us. But today we're not here to talk about us at Suzy. We're here to talk about the consumer. That's why you joined. That's why you've joined so many of our um, 14 state of the consumer webinars that we've been running since March. And it's really all about using Suzy's on-demand market research tool to help you put your finger on the pulse of the U.S. consumer. Um, and that's ultimately what we try to accomplish every single day. Right now, um, there's no notion that you may think is sacred for the consumer that isn't being called in the questions. The things that um, we have experienced as consumers is unlike anything else in history. And because of that, we constantly need to be asking consumers how they're thinking, how they're feeling, how they're behaving. And what I'm gonna try to paint for everybody today is what are the biggest changes that's occurred during 2020 that will be part of the consumer normality moving forward? The, you know, there are huge changes, tectonic changes that happen throughout history. and. With each of those changes, there's evolution that occurs. And some evolution is striking, um, and some evolution is something that's just gradual. And I'm going to try to give that distinction today on what changes are here to stay and what changes might just be a blip um, as the world kind of changes. I will be running um, a, um, a, an AMA, Ask Me Anything, after this. So if you have questions, please hold off until the end. We'll be sending out a link where you can share your questions, and we will actually just get started. So as we mentioned, we've been running these state of the consumer addresses since March. Um, we didn't know if we were if it was appropriate to run the first one, right? When the pandemic was starting to creep into um, the U.S. territory, but the feedback we got on the first one made us really emboldened in knowing this is a great service that we're providing um, to our clients. Um, we, like always, conduct research both on our own platform for first party research, as well as third party research to fuel our data. Um, the studies that I'm gonna be referencing today um, on the Suzy side uh, were based upon two studies that were conducted both in September and October, 2020, with sample sizes of 1,000 plus Americans. The samples are directionally representative of US consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So 2020, crazy year. Uh, I know most of us can't, you know, wait till it ends. Um, hopefully, you know, there's only brighter times ahead um, in 2021. Um, I actually shared this in February. Some people call me, uh, you know, a little bit of a negative person when I wrote this, but I wrote, um, everybody thought the year 2000 was going to reshape the world forever, but it's clear that it's going to be 2020. As for the U.S., the range of outcomes for this nation by the end of this year has never been wider. We have absolutely no idea what world we will be living in in 2021. I would say that this statement is just as true today in late October as it was in late February. Um, and we still have so much uncertainty right now that we're dealing with. Um, I started to see things happening personally around the end of February that business might not be normal. I posted this both on LinkedIn and Twitter when I said, I don't mean to be alarmist, but I think there's at least a 50% chance that major business events like South by Southwest will be canceled outright. And I can tell you without calling out individuals, but some of the smartest people that I know in the marketing, advertising, media industry called me crazy. They said, there's no way that big events like these would be canceled. And right now, the notion of a big event like South by Southwest occurring again is really hard to imagine. And that's how far um, things have changed um, and how far we've come, um, not necessarily in, in the better of directions uh, this year. We all remember that night on March 12th when it came out that Tom Hanks um, contracted the coronavirus and the NBA announced they're canceling their season or at least postponing it. Um, thankfully, it wasn't canceled. It did come back. And um, at least I'm very thankful it did because it was a great uh, sort of distraction from everything that's going on. But that was sort of the night that it all began. We soon thereafter at Suzy announced that we're closing our offices. This was again something that was quite early. Uh, we announced this in early April that we're going to be closing our office for the rest of the year. Um, not many companies had done it at this point. Our employees were completely freaked out. Um, but I think it was the right decision because it gave our team the ability to plan ahead um, and plan their lives for the remainder of the year. And obviously, it ended up being uh, the right decision. So we're in a different world. And before I get into the changes, uh, you know, and how the consumer will have forever changed as a result of 2020, um, first, I'm actually going to talk about what I'll call the evergreen notions of the consumer, things that will 
never change, things that I believe will always be part of the consumer, um, the everlasting consumer truth. Um, first and foremost, we crave adventure. And I don't believe consumers will ever stop craving adventure. We are not going to enter a world where consumers are okay waking up, going into um, their bedroom where they just slept to work, and then doing their exercise routines in their in their living room and actually watching a movie in their den and and calling that a, a a viable human experience. The reason that people work so hard is to actually afford themselves that adventure. And I think that we often forget about that when we talk about this consumer that's okay not working in an office or actually learning remotely. Adventure is part of our DNA and something that I don't think actually will ever go away. We need connection. We need to touch and feel other people. Zoom is not enough. I love all of you who are listening to this presentation today, but it's not enough just to be able to look at you through a webcam. You can't create that intimate human connection, which breeds such magic in so many different um, instances. And I think that that has not gone away. In fact, I think consu uh, consumers and humans in general yearn for connection even more right now. We value serendipity. Serendipity is something that I say over and over again. What does serendipity mean? It means right now I have to be intentional about the people who I talk to and bring in my lives. If I want to speak to somebody, I have to actually um, you know, schedule a meeting or schedule a call with them. I don't have the ability to maybe run into somebody in the elevator, run into somebody downstairs. That's a big deal. Because in that serendipity comes unexpected moments and then unexpected moments become unexpected ideas. And that's where innovation occurs. So I believe moving forward, we are going to seek out and actually try to manufacture serendipity more intentionally because we know how bad it can be when serendipity isn't just something that happens every day. And it certainly does not happen when you're stuck um, inside your house. Experiences matter. Experiences are what creates memories and memories are what creates personal identi identity, your personal brand, and really where so many people derive joy from. And right now we are living in a world devoid of experiences. And those experiences are things that consumers, humans crave and something that we're going to want back um, no matter what happens. So I think we often forget about the power of experiences in this world um, and how it impacts consumers if they can access those experiences. And community matters even more. The feeling of community, the feeling of walking to an office every day and having a routine, the feeling of talking to your Starbucks barista who knows your name every single day, um, you know, the feeling of who you sit next to at work, the feeling of who you might know um, at your local gym or your local pizza shop. Right now, we are really missing community and we're seeing it play out in our country on a geopolitical stage. And that's something that I think needs to come roaring back because in that community comes safety and security, which allows consumers the foundation to take risks and thrive. So those things won't change, but certainly a lot of things have changed. And today we're going to be talking about the four things forever altered in 2020. So my presentation today is basically on four major topics, the way we live, the way we shop, the way we eat, and the way we interact. And within these four territories, there are some dramatic changes that occurred. There are some winners that are going to come out of this that will never look back. There are some losers that have been impacted by this that will never recover in terms of corporations, in terms of trends. And that's really what I want to focus on so I can arm all of you listening today with the right information and really the right level of thinking in terms of how you can approach your business plans uh, for 2021. So first, we're going to be talking about live because the way we live have obviously changed. Um, How's an online remodeling platform recently reported nearly a 60% uh, annual increase in project leads for home professionals. People are looking at their home completely differently. And I'm going to talk about what that means in terms of how consumers live. We've heard a lot about the reversal of urbanization. Urbanization, a trend that really is a defining hallmark of the millennial generation. Um, for years, we've been saying that millennials really value the community and connectivity of city environments versus the space and privacy of suburbs. And we've seen that play out before the pandemic in real estate prices. Where I live in Brooklyn, over the last 10 years, real estate prices are up over 100%. Where in the neighboring suburbs, they are up 2 to 5%. But now we've seen that reverse. And the question is, is this a long-term trend? I believe what many people kind of overlook when they say that the cities are dead is that the cities create the density of thoughts and ideas of people and, and people that young people thrive on. 
And what we're starting to see slowly happen already in a place like New York City, as well as San Francisco, is rents are starting to drop. And the reason that rents are starting to drop is that older affluent um, you know, professionals, people with families, are moving out. It's become an accelerant to people who were going to move out of the city eventually anyway to actually happen faster. And with those rents dropping, what you're starting to slowly see is a little bit of a renaissance happening in cities. For those of you who live in a major city, I think you'll agree that any time a company went out of business, what would be replacing it would be a Starbucks or an Apple store um, or a CVS. There wasn't really that um, artistic community that happened with the diversity of ideas and diversity of businesses. Since that was happening in New York, what started to happen is a lot of the creativity and the and entrepreneurship throughout millennials got shifted to Brooklyn. And Brooklyn suddenly became more of a cultural hub in many ways in New York City. But with prices coming down, what you allow is that younger people to come back to the city again. Younger people are open up offices in the city again um, and, and open up businesses. And now you might start to see a renaissance occur over time. But I think this is going to take time. This is something that's not going to happen tomorrow. We are going to have to go through more pain in these major cities before we start to see this renaissance occur. But long term, I would not be betting um, against cities. But right now, we're not really worried about going out in the cities, are we? We're worried about spending time at home. Our homes have become our salvation. It has become our restaurant. It's become our gym. It's become our nightclub. It's become our classroom. It's become our office. Um, and nearly 80% of people are spending more time at home right now, regardless of ease restrictions. So, you know, it, even as restrictions went down, people still found themselves with new routines that were much more home-based. Over 50% of Americans say their home has taken on a new role. And that really breaks down to many different facets. Nearly 50% of people have repurposed areas of their home to replace their gym. Uh, online fitness, online fitness classes is one area that I think is sort of part of the new consumer. Um, there are so many now um, great ways, channels of content and equipment and ways that consumers can stay fit within the comfort of their own home. And assuming that uh, consumers have more have enough space to do so, um, I believe that many of the gyms that were becoming popular going into this may see a reversal. And I think so many consumers now have seen how effective it can be for them to work out in their own homes. And this is a trend that I think will last long past the pandemic. We saw Lululemon buy a company called Mirror, which is a fitness-based startup for half a billion dollars. Mirror, a device that you put in your house that allows you to almost have one-on-one -on -one interactions uh, with a trainer. Um, we've seen the dramatic rise of a company like Peloton, um, which is up several hundred percent in terms of their stock price this year. Uh, companies like Lululemon uh, that have been thriving, Nike, Fitbit, and even Dick Sporting Goods that, that arms consumers for, with the right equipment to be more ha having more outdoor lifestyle. So I think that companies like these really have no, no way but up to go as consumers value the fact that they can save time and money by exercising within their own home, not to mention a newly found paranoia of health issues is going to make consumers probably think twice about going into a sweaty environment with other people. So I think that this is a shift that's going to happen um, on the long term. And I think some of the winners are companies like Lululemon, Nike, and Peloton uh, moving forward. I think Lululemon's acquisition of Mirror was brilliant. We saw it happen a couple of years ago with Under Armour, who bought a company called Map My Fitness, um, a, a, an app that allowed you to sort of track your running. I think you're going to start to see more apparel, more hardware-oriented companies purchase software so they can have more one-on-one -on -one consumer engagement and a method to collect first-party data. When consumers are home, obviously many consumers have found themselves bored, right? Not enough to do. Um, with that, we've seen things like jigsaw puzzle sales soar. If I told you in January of this year that one of the hottest categories with consumers would be jigsaw puzzles, you might have said it was crazy. But if you make jigsaw puzzles, you probably had a pretty good year. Um, Nearly 50% of people have reimagined their home as movie theaters. Obviously, we are in the golden era of television and streaming with platforms like Netflix and Hulu um, and Amazon Prime. And it's really giving consumers a salvation during these dark times. And with that, they've really driven reinvestment in their home in terms of the technological infrastructure of their home. 
gaming has been another huge beneficiary of this pandemic. Um, it's become really the perfect in, um, activity, especially for millennials and Gen Z, because not only is it a way for you to entertain yourself, but gaming has turned largely social right now. When you look at platforms like Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite, that allows consumers not only to enjoy a game, but enjoy doing so uh, with their friends. Um, gaming has become a whole new form of entertainment. Um, Fortnite hosted a psychedelic concert with Travis Scott, one of the leading um, hip hop um, artists in the world, and over 12 million people watched. This was a highly produced, highly interactive, uh, visually stunning uh, uh, collaboration between Fortnite and Travis Scott, and people tuned in to see it. And you actually are your character on Fortnite, walking around and viewing through the eyes of your character what the concert looks like. And it really did create sort of a groundbreaking moment for the cross section of gaming and entertainment and music and something that I think we're gonna be seeing moving forward for sure. And now there's also platforms like Twitch and Discord, which almost become the communication layer that sits on top of gaming. What you'll start to see, especially with uh, Gen Z consumers, is that they are going to be playing a game like Fortnite but they're gonna have Discord um, open at the same time. And with Discord, they're gonna be communicating with them, with their friends, they're gonna be communicating with other people who they're playing against. And it really creates that truly immersive experience that I think consumers crave. So what I think that um, you know the pandemic did for esports and gaming in general is it really broadened gaming beyond the hardcore gamer to the casual gamer. And now, in perfect timing for the gaming industry, you have highly sophisticated new gaming consoles coming out this holiday season for, um, from companies like Microsoft with their new Xbox device um, and PlayStation, which is gonna bring, bring graphics and interaction to a whole new level. So if you are a brand out there, you need to think about what your strategy is with gaming, either working with gaming influencers um, or, or integrating otherwise into the gaming experience, because this is gonna forever become a new way where consumers spend so much of their time uh, and a significant amount of their money. So the winners really, you know, you look at a company like Netflix, which is up over 80% this year, and you know, you start to see the shift that's going on. Uh, one of the major shifts that we're seeing in content in general is the shift of power from Hollywood to Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, right now, whether you're Disney or you're Lionsgate or you're Universal, a traditionally big movie theater who was able to control, uh, you know, the, these big screen films. Well, the movie theaters right now, for the most part, shuttered. And what started to happen, as you know, is companies like Netflix um, and Amazon have been actually purchasing this content and with their big checkbooks and with their ability to lose money each year, they are slowly sucking all the creativity away from Hollywood into Silicon Valley. And it's forever shifted what it means to be in the entertainment business. And it's going to be interesting to see what, what that means moving forward. Obviously, Disney was a late entrance to streaming, um, and that has really saved their business in the wake of the theme parks not being open. Um, and we'll see how much Disney puts their Disney Plus streaming platform front and center. I'd also keep an eye on platforms like Sonos that have the hardware infrastructure for the home and platforms like Spotify that have gotten heavy um, into um, you know new age platforms like podcasting as of late. And again, really provides consumers with that much needed entertainment as they spend more time at home. Over 80% of consumers have made home improvements during the pandemic. And the home improvement DIY space is by far one of the biggest shifts that we've actually seen during this pandemic. It's turned brands into the role of an enabler, where essentially, and I always love the Home Depot line, you can do it, we can help. And now in an age of YouTube, in an age where consumers can easily access the content that they need to fix things on, on their own, do things, build things on their own without relying on a third party service agency to do so. We've really come into a whole new realm of consumers really embracing a DIY um, era with brand taking on brands like Home Depot, brands like Etsy, brands like Lowe's, really taking on more of a role as an enabler versus a brand that's going to give you a finished product. Um, consumers obviously have taken a renewed focus on cleaning their home, on getting the household goods, whether it's toilet paper or paper towels in mass through platforms like Costco. Procter & Gamble recently uh, reports that it had uh, the biggest organic sales growth since 2005. Um, based upon um, in-home consumption of items like toilet paper and cleaning supplies. Um, so, you know, the CPG category and the low involvement categories like cleaning supplies and 
toilet paper have now become the stars of this pandemic. Um, you know, who could forget the popularity of a, of a brand like Purell or Clorox uh, way back in March? So I think this is something that as consumers spend more time at home, even if they start to go back into the office, I do think they are taking a renewed focus on their home. And with that is a renewed focus on cleaning their home. And I think this demand is going to continue moving into 2021 um, and beyond. We might not see, obviously, the spikes of hoarders who are who are obviously getting a year's supply of toilet paper. But we will see consumers putting home cleaning much higher on their personal priority list. When we talk about upgrades, consumers have not just made you know major infrastructural uh, changes to their home. They've been doing things like buying more decorations, changing their linens, buying small appliances. You know, small investments that allow them to make the home more of their own, to personalize their living environment, a place that they're now starting to notice all the ways they can upgrade it because they're spending so much more time there. And that's why we've seen such a huge rise um, in companies like Wayfair, up over 130% uh, this year based upon the fact that now every nook and uh, you know, cranny of your home looks like an opportunity to buy a new accessory, to buy a new small piece of furniture. We talk about the Home Depot um, you know, um, boom, and, and, and competitors like Lowe's are also doing incredibly well. Williams-Sonoma, way to accessorize your home. Sherwin-Williams, so many people are now repainting their homes. And even Pinterest, a social media platform that consumers are using to create uh, mood boards on how they want to redecorate um, a new room or a new baby room or, or, or whatever it may be. And um, these are all long-term beneficiaries of this trend because again just like with exercising um, just like with cleaning products consumers will continue to look for ways to make their home their palace spend more money there if you look at the amount of time traditionally spent in an office which now is no longer um, is going to and is spent in the home even if we slowly get back to work there's still going to be that shift and with more time spent somewhere more dollars will go somewhere and in this case it certainly will be the home um, shopping. So shopping has obviously been just a transformation this year with consumers. Um, in the month of September alone, U.S. online sales um, rose 43% amid the pandemic. When this pandemic first hit, there was talk of the U.S. economy going into a depression. There was talk into people making runs at their bank to, to save cash and putting bars of gold um, or Bitcoin under their bed. And what we've seen is that for the large part of, of the U.S. economy, this has not deterred consumers from shopping. There is talk about a K-shaped recovery, which I do think it's happening. I think there's so many consumers right now um, around the country and really around the world that are struggling dramatically. Um, there are people that were waiters and waitresses um, or people in other industries where they are out of work and there's no new stimulus package and it's very hard for consumers to get by. But there's the other story of America where people are, are do have jobs and they are saving more money. And because of that, they are shopping like never before. Um, look at the savings rate, the personal savings rate, dramatic boom. You could barely see it because it's so high up. It's right above my head, right? It's right up here uh, where you see um, the personal savings rate in the United States nearing 35%. So 35% of the income is now being saved by consumers, and that's up from, from about 10% last year. So consumers are saving a lot of money. They're not going on vacations. They're not buying luxury goods. They're not spending money on Ubers or, or going out to as many restaurants, if any. And because of that, we're seeing a dramatic increase in personal savings rates. And that becomes pent-up demand and pent-up opportunity in the uh, e-commerce space, which is something I think is really going to play out during this upcoming holiday season. Now, at the same time, you have this dramatic shift happening. You see shopping malls completely going out of business. Um, you know, consumers obviously were not comfortable going to shopping malls for so long. And it was almost the last nail in the coffin for so many notions of traditional retail. Uh, speaking of traditional retail, you see companies like Forever 21, Kmart, JCPenney, and Nordstrom either bankrupt or on the verge of bankruptcy um, as a result of this happening. Um, specialty retail has had an incredibly hard time, as well as most big box uh, department stores, because ultimately, if you think about a big box department store like JCPenney or Kmart, their value is always selection. Um, and that actually is the one thing that e-commerce provides most uh, for consumers. Speaking of specialty retail, you see uh, companies like Gap really, you know, reevaluating their business model and reevaluating their footprint. Um, they have recently announced that they're going to be closing down almost every single store in American malls, the Gap being a staple 
in American malls for decades. So it's really emblematic of what we're starting to see um, in terms of traditional retail. And this is something that will not come back. Um, malls will not boom again they, the way they were prior. There may be malls, but the way that a mall is laid out and the reason why consumers go there is going to be completely different than walking around and, and, and collecting shopping bag after shopping bag. So this is another example of a long-term shift um, and the acceleration of the demise of traditional retail is something uh, that I think is here to stay. Uh, we're seeing it play out in, in major cities right now around the country as well. So it's not just the malls, it's on traditional retail space. Um, at the same time, people are already saying that they're going to miss shopping, right? So you have this uh, kind of dichotomy going on where you, you have traditional retailers going out of business. But at the same time, when we ask consumers, what are you going to miss most this holiday season? 40% said their family and 41% said shopping. Um, shopping is a tradition um, that a lot of consumers looked at as almost like a rite of passage for the holiday season. So we know that consumers yearn for those experiences. And the question is, how are they going to get them and how can they can be delivered in a way that's a viable business model uh, for the retailers? So where does this uh, uh, kind of demand to shop and spend go? Well, obviously, it's been going to e-commerce. The rise of e-commerce has probably been the number one accelerated shift that has happened during the pandemic and one that will not continue uh, its meteoric rise after the pandemic. It's only going to continue. Um, you look at the penetration of e-commerce as a percentage of all retail sales. In 2009, it was 5.6%. And going into 2020, it was 16%, which means it grew 10% from 6 to 16% over a period of 10 years. And then in an eight-week period between mid-March and, and mid-May, it went from 16% to 27%. So basically, you're looking at two months more acceleration than it happened the last 10 years prior. Um, and now uh, over 27% of all uh, retail shopping is e-commerce. And that number is only going up. To, to some people, it seems shocking that it wasn't more already, um, that going to this year, only 16% of all shopping was done online. And it shows how much growth and how much opportunity still exists. If you look at companies um, like Century 21, which is a New York area retailer that went out of business, the reason that they went out of business is they didn't have the online infrastructure. So when, so when all this hit and things changed, they couldn't shift to an online strategy like Nike did or like Lululemon did, which also had a retail infrastructure, but was able to step on the gas in their e-commerce. So I think it really is a lesson for all companies that you know, e-commerce, mobile commerce is no longer a nice to have. It needs to be front and center into your strategy because without it, you really don't have a business model anymore. So what are consumers buying? Uh, you know, it's no surprise that consumer hardware and computer hardware is up um, over 130% as now every student needs some type of laptop to actually go to school. Um, every worker needs their own, um, you know, computer and monitor and uh, printer and everything that they used to rely on the office for. So companies in the computer hardware, uh, you know, category have had a huge boom. We talked about sporting goods and, you know, this new focus on fitness vehicles. So we'll talk a little bit later about this new uh, boom and, and and um, you know, focus on buying cars and, and buying used cars as consumers want to get away, but they can no longer jump on airplanes anymore. So they're they're focusing either on buying parts and fixing up their car, much like their home, or buying new or used vehicles. Home and garden, really an extension of that um, home improvement phase that we saw. Toys and games um, and health and beauty. Health and beauty being interesting because you'd think that the health and beauty category would have more pressure on it just because people aren't going out as much and they're not going to work as much. Um, but what we found is that with more time, um, especially women, they they actually want to use that time to try new beauty products and they obviously want to look good on Zoom. Everybody does, right? So um, we've seen that increase as well. And many companies in the health and beauty space have done a great job shifting their focus uh, to online. Online is just the best experience for consumers to buy things. Over 90% of online shoppers, you know, believe that they can find almost anything they want to online. And that's been something that they, um, you know, really value in terms of, you know, using their time the right way and making sure that whatever they want, they can obviously get. Um, only 14% of shoppers believe they would shop online less post-crisis. Um, and that just goes to show you, you know, when this crisis ends, when we have the vaccine, you know, when we can get back to some semblance of normalcy. I don't think you're going to start to see e-commerce companies 
reverse this dr dramatic growth they're saying. I only think it's going to continue. Once you've had a good experience buying something in a product and it's effective for you and it's price effective for you and you get what you want, you're not going to go back to wasting the time to go into a retailer. You, that will become the new way you shop. Um, talking about shopping online, how do our consumers finding the products that they want to purchase? Um, about two thirds are looking at retailer websites and two thirds are also looking at social media. Um, social media is no less important now than it was five, 10 years ago. It's, it's more important because of their proliferation on mobile devices. It's where consumers spend their time, the majority of their time when they're on their phones. And when they're looking for products, they are much just as much likely to type your brand and search for it in Instagram or go to your um, Facebook profile page um, as they are to go to a retailer website. And I think two too many e-commerce companies are focusing too much on their website and not enough in terms of bringing your content to them, which is within social media. And one of the biggest shifts we've seen in terms of e-commerce is now nearly 70% of consumers are using their desktop to buy. We were entering um, you know, this phase where everybody thought desktops were dead. Everyone was getting an iPad. Everybody was getting a phone. But now that we're home, everybody's obviously buying new desktops and they're spending more time on their desktop at home. And because of that, they're much more likely to buy. So we shifted from a world very quickly from e-commerce that just focus on M-commerce, right? Mobile commerce to maybe we need to relook at the desktop as well um, as consumers are much more likely to have a home office and a desktop to, to actually shop from. But you can't talk about e-commerce without talking about the big A, um, Amazon, the company that will forever be known as the company that redefined e-commerce and really put it on the map to being a kind of a foundational uh, pillar for the global economy. Um, and what Amazon has done since their small beginnings of, of, of selling books has been, you know, nothing short of amazing. And they continue to innovate and put pressure and really lead the path for any company that's in e-commerce. Uh, they are going into new categories. They recently announced they're launching a luxury fashion platform. So, um, which went live and, you know, it remains to be seen how successful that's going to be, but you know, there was a time when Amazon wasn't in groceries and then they bought Whole Foods. And there's really no category that is growing, that's substantive, that Amazon is not going to try to find its way into either through building it or buying an outside company like they did with Whole Foods. Um, and ultimately, Amazon is about convenience and it's about ubiquity. It's about saving you time, saving you money, and understanding that you're going to be able to get whatever product you want. And if Amazon can create the right um, experience, luxury experience, there's no reason to believe that they're not going to be successful um, in the luxury market as well. Like so many great e-commerce companies, they are now getting into physical retail and they are sort of redefining as well what physical retail means. Um, time is one thing that consumers value more than ever they always have. And with a platform like the Amazon Go retail channel, it allows consumers to enter with a credit card, shop and just walk right out and it will bill your credit card uh, through RFID technology. Um, Amazon's pushing this out um, in major cities and they are really gonna redefine what it means to be a retailer and also eliminate a lot of jobs uh, while they're doing it. Because every cashier who once had you know, that job as a cashier probably will not, no longer have that job anymore if Amazon you know, really drives a more efficient way uh, for companies to be able to um, operate their retail establishment. So it remains to be seen how successful Amazon's gonna be with their offline channels, but they will definitely pave the path for other physical retailers. Walmart, has really started to get its game together when it comes to e-commerce. Uh, they recently decided to take on Amazon Prime uh, with something called Walmart Plus with a cheaper membership fee of only $98 versus the $120 fee that Amazon Prime is. And what it means to be an Amazon Prime member for the 1% of you on this call that are an Amazon Prime member means that you get free shipping, most importantly, and you can access their Amazon Prime video platform Walmart's getting into the game. They basically are, are coming in cheaper. Now they still don't have the ubiquity and the ecosystem that Amazon has with its Alexa devices and with its um, you know, Amazon Prime Video platform where you can stream great shows and movies. You know, they're gonna have to really continue to invest to compete. But Walmart is a strong brand and there's still much of America that isn't using Amazon the way that maybe some people on the coast are. And it becomes an opportunity for Walmart to try to put pressure and compete. And one thing Walmart has is tremendous relationships with the largest manufacturers um, you know, of consumer packaged goods in the world in the food and beverage space. Walmart's been working with the, the Procter and Gamble's of the world and the Coca-Cola's of the world for way longer than Amazon has. And Am while Amazon might 
be looked at as competition for so many companies. Walmart, not so much. So it's going to be interesting how Walmart leverages their brand, leverages their relationships moving forward to maybe put a little bit of pressure on Amazon, uh, you know, ahead. Other brands like Nike are feel like the equity of their brand is strong enough to take a stand against Amazon. Uh, they made the announcement last year to pull their products from Amazon. Um, and the reason why is they didn't feel like they could kind of protect the sanctity of their brand in an environment where they felt they were being commoditized. Now, Nike has a tremendous e-commerce platform. They have a tremendous brand. Um, you know, th they have the best athletes in the world. They are at the center of cultural relevance. They can pull it off and they have pulled it off by evidence of their performance this year. Not all companies can, but you know, if you're a lifestyle brand and you see Amazon commoditizing that brand, it may be time, you know, for some brands to to go in this direction. Um, and that, you know, they're continuing to go in that direction by doubling down on direct to consumer, cutting out uh, nine additional partners uh, since then. Other companies like Warby Parker, a tremendous e-commerce company, um, in a, in obviously a vertical, the eye care vertical has really understood what it means to create online experiences. We talked earlier about the value of experiences for consumers in this pandemic. And what Warby Parker has done through an augmented reality um, integration is essentially you can have any of their glasses tried on your face and see exactly how they're gonna look remotely. And that creates an experience that Amazon likely would never invest in for each category. Warby Parker also has their offline infrastructure with stores. They have great customer service and they've done exactly what it, it, it takes to be able to stand out in an Amazon dominated e-commerce world. And that's why they continue to go on a path towards IPO and why they really are an unstoppable force in the eyewear category. They invest in consumer experience. You know, maybe some of the numbers crunchers would look at the investment to build this augmented reality application, say it's not worth it, but obviously, experience matters and we're actually seeing it come to bear there. We're also seeing new innovative ways that consumers are shopping. Um, something called Bopus, buy online, pick up in store, is going to be you know, a, an increasingly popular trend for retailers, knowing that consumers might want a product today, but they might not want to be in a store amongst other people. So they're gonna be purchasing online at walmart.com and then driving to their local Walmart and it's going to be sitting outside for them. And obviously we've seen a lot of quick service restaurants do the same thing. I think Bopus is going to be a huge trend moving forward. And a lot of retailers, Starbucks included, um, shifting to sort of, you know, leaning into their app, allowing consumers to order on an app. And basically that's the only way you can get your coffee from there. I think you're going to start to see more retailers shift um, into this dimension. We've also seen some consumers shun the notion of retail um, or, or commerce in categories where they feel that they can save time and money by doing it on their own. So when we talk about DIY, there's DIY for home decor, but there's also DIY in terms of figuring stuff out that you used to pay other people to do. Um, L'Oreal did an incredible campaign this year with Eva Longoria, you know, an A-list Hollywood actress, showing how she can color her hair at home. Uh, you know, this is somebody that traditionally would have, uh, you know, had a huge hair and makeup team and an entourage of people to make her look a certain way to be on camera. And here she is sort of bearing herself and showing how this product works. And I think it's really emblematic. It's almost if it's good enough for Eva Longoria, it's good enough for, for us, right? And I think what L'Oreal is trying to show you is maybe you don't need the salon the way that you used to, if you can figure out how to do it on your own. Uh, over 50% of consumers are conducting at-home self-care or beauty treatments to replace spas. They're figuring out how to pamper and take care of themselves and beautify themselves on their own, while in the past they might have outsourced it. 40% um, of people saying they won't return using professional beauty because of costs. So, you know, this is something where it's a time saver, it's a money saver. And through this pandemic, whether it's changing the oil on your car or, um, you know, cutting your dog's, uh, you know, cu cutting your uh, dog, trimming your dog, they figured out on their own. My amazing wife has been cutting my hair now for the last uh, six months. I think it looks pretty good. So will I go back to my hairstylist? Maybe not. Um, so Sparkle, if you're watching, it's my hairstylist, sorry, but you know, I think that I figured out a way at home to get it done a little bit better. So I think many consumers are looking at it uh, that way. 
There's platforms like Etsy out there that allow consumers to buy custom crafts um, and, and, and create their own products and sell them online. So the notion of e-commerce has gone beyond just traditional brands like um, Nike and allowing consumers to create and purchase new products, again, to beautify your home in a way that's personal to you. And you know, in terms of the DIY craze, a company like Michael's has seen over a 300% increase year over year in their e-commerce platform as consumers continue to buy things like, um, you know, art canvases and paint to paint their own paintings at home or create uh, their own crafts and accessories, again, to personalize their home. So I think the culmination of this e-commerce trend, the home trend, the DIY trend really collapses on the company in a good way, like Michael's, which is really driving up their growth. Um, and going back to Amazon in terms of e-commerce, I'm going to talk a little bit about this holiday season because while we're doing a year in review for most retailers, the year hasn't started yet, right? That happens during the holiday season. Um, Amazon uh, moved back their Amazon Prime Day, which is their all product sale um, from usually July to October 13th and 14th. We'll find out later this week how well that that did. And at the same time, Apple, obviously one of the biggest e-commerce players and really consumer players that exist, unveiled their new iPhone. So you're seeing all this demand move up and now the holiday season start a little bit earlier. Um, a third of people plan to participate in Black Friday, but that's down from basically double that a year ago. And I think Black Friday, obviously the day after Thanksgiving where consumers traditionally rush into retailers will likely be a, a thing of the past this year and maybe for good, um, as consumers don't really feel the need now to wait in line and go into a store anymore. They now know, so many more consumers now know that it's much easier for them to get the best product at the best price simply by going on their computer or their phone. So is this the end of Black Friday? I don't think Black Friday will ever be at 64% again. Cyber Monday is usually the Monday after Thanksgiving, the first day people go back to the office. And since they're in the office and they, they can't go to a store, they're shopping on their uh, computer because they're away from their families and they're at work, but they're kind of not working and they're hungover from eating too much turkey um, and they're, they're shopping on Cyber Monday. I think Cyber Monday has already started. I think Cyber Monday started with Amazon Prime Day. So I think that you probably will not see the big boost of e-commerce on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. You're just going to see an elevated output of e-commerce from what was Amazon Prime Day uh, in early October all the way through uh, to the Christmas season. Um, and the winners here are clear. There's companies like Shopify, who uh, as early as this morning announced a new deal with TikTok to help power um, e-commerce on the you know rapidly growing popular TikTok app. Um, you see companies like Square that are arming companies with the ability to drive e-commerce, both offline and online, having tremendous year. Costco, as companies look at their home and, and move from the city and have more room, they're going to shop more wholesale. And obviously, Amazon, as well as companies like eBay, as consumers have more time now to clean out their closets and sell old stuff. So these are going to be the winners, not only today, but moving forward um, as this e-commerce boom really just continues to grow in popularity. Um, e. So food, obviously, another huge change. Consumers are cooking uh, more than ever. If you look at the trend since 1997, um, where at that point, um, only 45% of food was eaten away from home and about 55% was eaten at home. Now you're starting to see this shift and the shift has started way before that, right? We're coming into this year, way more consumers were consuming food away from home, at work, um, at restaurants, while they were traveling. And now all of a sudden, you're seeing reversal of this trend, where now consumers are starting to obviously spend so much more time at home cooking their food, eating their own food. Um, over 50% of consumers, however, at the same time, saying, is saying dining out is one of the things they've missed most during the pandemic. So I do believe restaurants will come back because it, restaurants aren't just about eating. They're about a social experience. They give consumers sort of the connectivity that they're so very much craving um, right now. But at the same time, they found new ways to leverage new channels to consume food at home. Instacart, you know, it's a platform that allows you to get other people to shop at grocery stores for you, has doubled in valuation um, over the last two years and has really become a de facto way for so many consumers to get one hour grocery delivers, delivery and save them so much time and not having to go to a grocery store, but having other people uh, do it for you. Uh, the alcohol and beer category is one that's long struggled to really hop on the e-commerce train. Um, Amazon, not a big uh, purveyor of, um, you know, 
products in that category. And now it's opened up the opportunity for new startups like Drizzly, which has seen growth over 1600% as consumers consume far more uh, beer, uh, liquor, and wine at their home. Obviously, they're not doing so much at bars, nightclubs, and restaurants um, anymore. With more time at home, consumers are learning how to cook. Three quarters of consumers over 21 said they're now more skilled in the kitchen. And more than half believe they're going to continue to cook more after the crisis. This will be a major change coming out of it. We went to a world where we were just ordering in, especially in um, urban metropolitan areas. And now more consumers are learning how to cook uh, because they're not going out to restaurants. And cooking has really taken on a renewed popularity um, in this country. Uh, What are people cooking? Everything from banana bread, the pizza dough, the French toast. Uh, Bread makers were one of the most popular products this year uh, with over 500% increase um, in online sales of bread makers as consumers wanted to go the old fashioned way and take time baking their bread uh, as as they have uh, more time. So it's really given companies in the food and beverage space sort of the ability to take a step back and say, what type of brand do I want to be? And we talked about Lowe's and Home Depot being brands as enabler. Well, now we're looking at a lot of brands being brands as ingredient, where no matter what type of food you make, you can actually reposition your brand to a brand as ingredient, as a part of a recipe, as a part of something that you can do with your family to actually drive new uses of your product and put it really in the center of how consumers are looking at the food um, and beverage category. And of course, you have Ikea, who everyone loves their meatballs, or telling people how you can make Ikea's famous meatballs at home. Plant-based meat has continued to grow as consumers put a renewed uh, focus on health and wellness. Um, Companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger are having great years this year um, as consumers want to try out um, plant-based meats, focusing on their health and having more time to try out new things. And the the comfort food category or the snack food category has had a tremendous year. PepsiCo recently just announced uh, a tremendous increase in sales uh, with, with their snack food category as consumers are home more. So it is this dichotomy of people on one hand buying plant-based foods and the other hand buying snack or comfort foods as they turn on Netflix. And both those categories have had tremendous years this year. Um, Uber recently acquired Postmates so they can have a delivery service um, you know, uh, extension as West consumers are using ride hailing to get to work, more are definitely ordering in food and, and Uber uses sort of a hedge for the pandemic to get more in the food delivery space. And some of the QSR companies like Chipotle have just done a tremendous job at really quickly pivoting to mobile order pickup. Uh, they know that while you know not as many consumers might want to hang out in their restaurants, you know, no doubt, so many consumers will want to spend time, you know, at you know at home eating their great products and you know going to, going into the store and picking it up. And that's something that consumers love doing, and they're going to get used to doing in terms of the relationship uh, with the QSR category. Uh, Subscription-based platforms also are growing dramatically. You see Panera recently coming up with a coffee subscription service. All you can drink coffee, $9 a month. Um, It's a way to kind of drive new habits with consumers. Take advantage of this pandemic. They say never let a crisis go to waste, right? Well, Panera is looking as a way to kind of reinvent a new category to get consumers going back to their store over and over again. I think this is a trend that you might see more food and beverage companies, um, you know, adopt. And you have companies like Kraft Heinz having direct to consumers. So again, as the world changes, as Kraft might not be able to rely on traditional channels anymore, how are they going to make sure that they have ongoing recurring business with their customers? Many companies like Kraft Heinz are looking at a direct-to-consumer channel to sell their products directly to consumers, not through a supermarket or third-party retailer. I think it's going to be challenging for these companies because I don't know if consumers are going to want to sign up for a different platform for ketchup and a different platform for bread and a different platform for soda. I think their best bet is, is partnering with the Costco's of the world. But you know, if they can create a good enough experience for consumers, maybe they will indeed succeed there. So. The winners in the food space, companies like Beyond Meat and Dunkin' Donuts and um, Instant Cart, Domino's had a tremendous year, really amazing e-commerce experience for consumers. And everyday household uh, food products like Conagra all have had tremendous years this year in terms of their business. And moving on to the last section, interact, the way that we interact. I don't know if you saw this, but a couple of weeks ago, the Flaming Lips performed a live concert for their fans where people encapsulate it in bubbles. Uh, For the record, I do not think that's going to be the future of concert going, um, but I do think that the way that people interact, um, you know, 
before this is not gone forever. Uh, I think that some of the things that are gone will come back, but there will be changes uh, like in every other category. We can't talk about the way the consumers interact without talking about Zoom, which has become obviously a household brand in 2020, not just with technically, uh, you know, technologically adept people, but with people's grandmothers who now all of a sudden they're technologically adept, where Zoom has become a way where people are sharing their weddings um, and sharing really every meaningful moment in their life. And it's just been amazing to see what Zoom has done. Uh, they've recently have announced um, you know, a whole new platform where you can tie in third-party apps. And I think Zoom is here to stay um, and competitors like Microsoft Teams in terms of becoming a de facto way consumers communicate for more than half the time. I think while offices will creep their way back in the culture, it won't be full time like it was before. And that's why I think platforms like these are going to continue to thrive. They've also obviously taken their hand to online learning. This is Zoom's new online learning integration where a teacher can actually see everybody. I think it's really cute that they can do that. It reminds me of the NBA, what they did with their uh, virtual fans. I think online learning, however, um, is a challenging thing for consumers, which we'll get into. Um, so let's talk about some of the ways that we interact and what's going to change. First and foremost, business travel. Uh, Southwest CEO said it may be 10 years before business travel returns. So we're focusing on leisure flyers. I think business travel will never be the same way again. Um, as a CEO of a, of a startup that's always looking at costs, I can tell you that doing online events like this have been way more impactful than sending a sales team uh, to a conference. And I think coming out of this, we are going to be more emboldened to double down on our digital content and digital event strategy uh, versus physical events. So I think business travel is going to look completely different coming out of this as consumers value their time and time spent with family more than ever. I don't think that's going to return. But when you look at consumer travel, I think the pent up demand is something that is even hard to put in words in terms of how much consumers are talking about how they yearn a venture, how much they yearn to go back on the road again and travel, have those adventures, have that serendipity, have that experience. The MX CEO says he's seeing big pent up demand for travel. Um, Airbnb sales grew by 41% in the month of September alone. Airbnb has been a huge beneficiary of travel this year as consumers tend to feel way more comfortable you know, staying in, in rented homes than going into a hotel where you're sharing an elevator and a hallway and a lobby with other people. And Airbnb is going to be just a tremendous success story moving forward, especially as consumers might be hesitant, even for leisure travel, to jump back on a plane right away. They will take road trips. Uh, they will rent or, bu or buy a, a new or used car. And Airbnb will, will be the beneficiary of that. Uh, they were very innovative at launching uh, something called Airbnb's online experiences to allow people sort of to virtually travel. Um, heading into this. So I think that's, that's, it, it's great to see them pivot, but their core business is really coming, uh, raging backwards. Um, online learning companies like Udemy, um, and Skillshare and Coursera, uh, have really been huge beneficiaries of this, whether it's learning a, a new skill, uh, that you want to have a hobby in or a new skill that you need for work. Um, many adults have looked at online learning as really a lifesaver and something that's taught them a new language and really enriched them personally. So for individuals that want to capture learning experiences, this is a new trend that I think we can expect to last for a very long time. Um, virtual classes have been around forever, but now people are 69% more likely to pay for online education in the future. And it's something good for a brand to understand. We talk about DIY, the importance of content, where consumers are spending their time. Brands need to be investing in educational content in the categories that they're in. If I'm Huggies, I'm putting out educational content for new moms to, to engage them and doing it for free to build your brand versus running another 30 second spot during Judge Judy. I think this is really where the focus uh, should be. Uh, people are also, when talking about the office, they're okay working from home in terms of professionals. Uh, a third believe they've been more productive working from home uh, than the office. Um, and 90% believe that flexible working arrangements moving forward would for sure boost their morale. So I think while the office will come back, I can tell you, Susie will be opening an office as soon as we can, we will certainly have more flexible working arrangements. So I think the shift that's gonna occur is it's not gonna be a taboo anymore for people working from home. People are gonna have the right equipment, be armed and have the infrastructure, and the company will have the cloud-based infrastructure to enable a remote working environment. But at the same time, the connectivity that consumers crave will not go away. So I do think we'll see more of a hybrid environment. Uh, but for students and for kids, that's a different story. We asked 
parents, what are the biggest struggles with remote learning? And they're saying that their kids have distraction and they lack motivation and there's no consistency and they don't have the right routine. And I think for kids, the ability to be around their classmates and for them to have real human connections with their teachers is just so critically important to um, a kid's upbringing intellectually and socially. And I think moving forward, the notion that schools can be remote, that college and universities can be remote is just not the case. And I think schools will be back. So when you look at travel, I think yes for leisure travel. I don't think uh, business travel will be the same way again. Sure, it will happen, but to a lesser extent. When you look at learning, I think um, and work, I think that corporations will address that to a certain extent, and it'll be a hybrid situation. But I think for students, I think you're going to start to see school and education uh, for you know student age kids, call it K through 12, and even through the college years, definitely go back to an in person environment. And then lastly, telehealth. Um, telehealth is something that many consumers have adopted during this pandemic, quickly learning that they can uh, get their doctor's appointment or checkup without ever leaving their home. And I think this is going to be another huge evolution in the medical field coming out of this, uh, where more consumers will be adopting telehealth in so many different categories where they can, especially as the technology gets better. So that's where I feel we're looking for 2021, 2022. I'm just going to wrap it up um, with two slides to try to sum everything up. Um, in a bow for you all. And again, um, I will be doing an um, Ask Me Anything Q&A right after this, um, which we'll share out. I'm sure Abel will share out the link for it right when I'm done. So um, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Um, as soon as I take a breath of fresh air, we'll go into the Q&A after this. Um, so first and foremost, um, I believe that there's a trade-off going on right now. Where right now consumers are trading off the ability to have more comfort for less excitement. What does that mean by more comfort? It means they're saving more, spending more time with their family, accessing critical services like telehealth, having more time, having the ability and comfort to work from home, being in their home more, investing more at home. That breeds them comfort. Um, it's, you know, you talk about the, the, the human struggle between comfort and adventure. Uh, and I think we've over indexed on comfort 99 to one this year and consumers are enjoying that comfort. But with that comes less excitement, less serendipity, less travel, less sporting events, less mystery, um, less new relationships that you're creating, less dining out. And I think that trade off is something that is not sustainable long term because the more comfortable we get, the more bored we get, the less inspired we are, we get. I think the less that we evolve as people and the less that culture and society involves, which got us to a place that we are today. But I do think consumers will want to retain some elements of that comfort, whether it's time with family or time at home or maybe saving a little more. But at the same time, you know, you are definitely going to see, you know, a rebalancing of this as soon as we can, as consumers crave that excitement and leisure and adventure that they so desperately want. So I think moving forward for you to be able to thrive and succeed um, as a company, there's really, and I'm going to try to move out so you can see his last thing. Let's see if we do it. Perfect. Um, you know, I think there's three things that there's three main pillars for consumers. There's safety. I think the need for safety for consumers is going to be there for good meaning that consumers will always want now to be safe. They're not going to want to put themselves at health risk. Speed. I think consumers have gotten used to hitting a button, having things delivered more than ever before, and they're going to want that speed and convenience in every single thing they do, meaning they're not going to want to go to a mall for a product and find out it's not in stock. And lastly, they crave connection. And connection has been the thing that they've so desperately been devoid of during this pandemic. So I think companies that are going to win are ones that either offer safety and speed like Instacart or Teladoc, which allows you to get your groceries or see a doctor without having to go to a supermarket um, you know, or a medical office. Companies that give you safety and connection, allow you to see your loved ones and, or, or be around other people in an area that won't expose you. So whether it's Airbnb allowing you to rent a house with close friends versus a hotel or people buying a Tesla so they can travel without being on an airplane. And then speed and connection, the way that you can connect with people more virtually, but with speed. And you see companies like um, Peloton um, and Zoom really winning in that space. I think these are the three winners, companies in these three spaces that are going to be really winning um, coming out of it. And I think it's going to be super interesting uh, to see where kind of things go moving forward. So um, I want to thank all you guys for... Uh, joining today. I know I uh, talk really fast, but I promised our team that I would try to get this done in an hour, 100 slides in an hour. For those of you who know me, you know that's kind of how I roll. 
But uh, it's been amazing hosting these webinars. We're going to continue to do it. Uh, that's our new normal is hosting these state of the consumer webinars. And I uh, can't wait to hear what the rest of our team has uh, in store for us today. So back to you, Avi. Awesome, Matt. Dude, thank you very much. Um, incredible presentation as always. And, uh, you know, as, as, you're, as you're talking through the, the presentation, I'm just sitting here going, you know, my head's shaking back and forth thinking about this entire year and what's happened. And um, it really is uh, a testament to all the work that we've done at Suzy to help bring this content forward. And, you know, we're going to continue to do it going into next year. So um, for everyone who wants to uh, join Matt for the Ask Matt Anything session, you should see a link in the uh, corner of your screen. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going that great. Was, uh, such an incredible presentation there. I think it, I was moderating the comments there and I think people had a lot of excitement, um, you know, for the trends that you were talking about and kind of for the future that you really painted there. Um, I, I think one of the first questions that we have for you, a lot of people were curious about how you kind of came up with these trends and a little bit more about uh, the Suzy data that was kind of incorporated, where that came from, how that really comes yeah. to be. So when we look at market research versus maybe how the rest of the industry does, I personally don't believe people get value from just sharing stats, right? So I can tell you that we ask consumers what their favorite color t-shirt is, and we could say 80% like red, 5% like white, and 15% like blue, but that doesn't really give you insights and doesn't give you something to act on. So, you know, the way that we look at insights at Suzy is really a combination of uh, first party data and third party data. First party data being our own Suzy platform. For those of you who don't know Suzy, we have um, our own always on panel of over a million US consumers that us and over our 250 enterprise clients use every day to talk to people in any census-based criteria that they want feedback from. And we use that on an ongoing basis to track and benchmark how consumers are thinking and feeling. Uh, we'll run that research and based upon what we're learning and uncovering, I will then dig deeper um, and work with our team to uncover third party research, headlines, trends, and really culminate together. And it's within that first party research, third party research, and really, um, you know, strategic and forward looking insights, are we actually able to start to paint for our clients a picture of the future? Not only is it's not always right, right? Sometimes we're wrong. But I think when we do this, we really put our clients and our audience in a position to succeed. That's a great. Um, and Matt, I think people were really interested in kind of that last slide that you shared uh, yeah. with the three pillars for the, of the consumer. Um, one person specifically was interested in the speed section uh, that you talked about and really how that they should really interpret that, that kind of data there. Yeah, I mean, speed is really about convenience. You know, it's basically about allowing consumers to get what they want when they want it. And if you think about retail, traditional retail, for example, they traditionally have not been able to get what they want when they want it, right? They've had, they've had to, um, you know, maybe go to a store, wait in line, figure out it's not there. Or when you go to a doctor's office, right? There's not speed. You usually have a 1230 appointment, you'll get seen until 130. So I think right. speed means getting what you want when you want it. So it's, it's saving you time, it's saving you money. Uh, it's making your life easier. Definitely. Um, Matt, this is actually a, such a timely thing because we talked about it during our last uh, holiday webinar. But, you know, based on your kind of uh, best analysis, is there an explanation in terms of how you predict consumer behavior to happen since uh, Amazon Prime Day uh, and kind of how the upcoming elections might influence that um, yeah. in, in kind of the, the kind of next few weeks? Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, I think a lot about Amazon. Um, disclaimer, I am an investor in Amazon. So uh, take that with um, a grain of salt. But I don't think there's any way that Amazon loses this holiday season. Um, I think if the pandemic rages, people will not go to retail stores. But since they have record high savings, they're going to buy more at Amazon. I think that if the pandemic doesn't, the economy gets better and people want to buy more at Amazon. I think if the stimulus comes at any point, I think people are going to buy more. If there's civil unrest, people will be more likely to be home and still buy from Amazon. So I think companies like Amazon and their global competitors like Alibaba, JD.com, Mercado Libre, Shopify, I think all are going to do incredibly well moving forward as we grow from 27% penetration e-commerce to so much of a higher level moving forward. 
Definitely. Um, Matt, one question. Can you talk a little bit about food delivery trends such as Uber, DoorDash, and uh, the rise of these kind of ghost kitchens? Yeah, I mean, so ghost kitchens, for those of you who don't know, is just a different way for the delivery, food delivery industry to exist, where instead of you having to have your own Chinese restaurant, you know, ghost kitchens basically are kitchens that can kind of create any single type of, um, you know, food, uh, you know, cuisine, whether it's Japanese or Chinese or Mexican or Italian, whatever it may be. And it can all be cooked within the same kitchen. And they can create five or six, 10 different types of brands that all would be sold on Grubhub or Seamless. So it's really just a, a, a better way for consumers to get high quality food with a slightly better business model. I think to answer your question in terms of the growth of these areas overall, I mean, Uber recently was, um, you know, there was a court case decision that came down, which called their drivers employees versus independent contractors, which is in California, which is really going to impact Uber and Lyft's business model because it means they need to pay more for their drivers. And for companies like this to really survive moving forward, they're going to need to rethink their business model. And one way they're going to be doing so is really to kind of go into uh, the food delivery space. I think that if you look at the three types of places people eat, which is cooking at home, ordering in food and eating at restaurants. Obviously right now, restaurants have gotten killed, which means many more people are cooking at home, many more people are ordering in. I think when restaurants start to open up again, I don't think less people will be cooking from home. I just think less people will be ordering in. So I think, you know, if there's gonna be pressure in any category, it's gonna be the, the order in category as restaurants take from that share. But I think the cooking category, because it does save consumers um, money and it is sort of a family, you know, connective oriented activity is here to stay. Definitely. By the way, I see a question. Can we download the handout? We will be sending out a, a handout to download it. Those of you who know me know that I finished this deck about three minutes before the presentation because uh, I wanted to have up-to-date information. Absolutely. Um, this is kind of an interesting question here, but you've obviously seen the increase in Bopis, uh, which is buying online, purchase in-store, and then you've also seen kind of the rise in home delivery as two uh, of now the really emerging ways that people are getting products. So Matt, in your opinion, uh, do you think Bopis is the future or do you think home delivery is going to be the future? I mean, I think they both are. I think that, I think you're going to see rises in both those categories and less of a rise in people buying things in store. So I think traditional retailers are gonna struggle. I think the thing that Bobus gives consumers is it does save them time because they know, they're not spending time wandering the aisles. And, right. and that is also sort of a safety element as well. They're not bumping into people. And, but they do have the time knowing that I know I'm gonna get this the same day. So I think if you look at that, you know, again, three tiered, um, you know, concentric circles, it does deliver upon that. They both do. Definitely. Um, Matt, next, next question for you is specifically around uh, virtual events for companies um, that have kind of really been a cornerstone uh, of their plans. So, um, you know, what what do you think will happen in terms of event culture and both on maybe the, the um, you know, B2B side, but also on the consumer side as well? So it's really two different things, right? I mean, I think that event culture on the consumer side is critical to culture, it's critical to society, it's critical to, to youth, right? And I think Coachella will be back, Burning Man will be back, the NFL will be packing stadiums again. This is what people live for, this is what they work for. You know, to be, to feel that community uh, this, and the sense of connection with tens of thousands of people all listening to the same concert at a Coldplay concert. Um, uh, song and a Coldplay concert. Like, I don't think that's going to go away. I think as soon as now it may be a creep back because people need to feel safe enough. But I think that that's here to stay. When you look at a business event, essentially at its core, it's an investment. And there's a CFO somewhere approving that investment. The investment in the cost of the event, the investment in travel, the investment in having people out of the office. And I think when you're looking at the ROI of a physical event, whether it's the Cannes Advertising Festival or the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas or so many other events at us at Suzy and you guys have attended before, you need to look at what's the ROI, why are you sending them there? And if it's to generate leads or generate relationships, it can be done. Now, listen, it's not binary. You're gonna wanna be in front of your customers. You're gonna wanna create relationships, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be spending as much putting people on the road as you have in the past. Uh, you know, Our board meetings at Suzy, for example, are online. We have a board member in Colorado. It's been so effective that he probably doesn't need to travel from Colorado to New York for 
our future board meetings. It would make no sense. It's not a good use of his time. And we don't really gain anything by him being there versus, you know, what we've gained by him being there virtually. Definitely. Um, I guess it's kind of a subject of you know, the in-person event, but, uh, you know, we think movie theaters are slowly starting to climb back up in terms of places that uh, are reopening. What are your opinions on uh, the intersection of movies and kind of the rise of things like Move On on Disney Plus uh, and kind of that as a, as a different way of, um, you know, new movies coming to market? So I think movie theaters are going to end up being an extension of the streaming companies. I think a company like Netflix or who is going to buy AMC theaters and use it as a way to kind of have a physical way for people to touch and feel their product the same way Apple opened up a retail store for people to touch and feel their product. But I don't think that consumers are going to want to necessarily go back to theaters shoulder to shoulder. Cause you look at time and safety, the equation's not there and the value of the viewing experience at home has become dramatic. Now, before the pandemic, there were companies like iPick that were doing incredibly well by creating like a luxury experience for consumers. And I think if a company is going to win in the theater space, it's going to be a company like that, that makes it an immersive experience. It goes beyond watching the movie. Um, but I do think the business model of movie theaters are, are very much in question coming out of this. Definitely. Um, you know, I know you talk a lot about this idea that movie uh, theaters might be purchased by the likes of Netflix, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of an interesting question and I'll, it's more of a statement, but uh, this person said Amazon should take over malls. What is your opinion on that uh, as something? Do you think that's likely? Where do you think that's going to go? Um, I don't, I would, I think it's more likely that Shopify would take over malls because Shopify works with tens of thousands of retailers and merchants. So you look at the price of Shopify in terms of their stock price and, you know, they're, they're a company that's over a hundred billion dollars in market cap. Uh, there's no reason why Shopify wouldn't be able to buy general growth partners or another company that owns all these malls. And now all of a sudden offer the ability for retailers to have online retailers have a physical space in malls. I think when you look at Amazon, um, Amazon looks for, you know, well-placed refrigerated, well-lit warehouses in urban metropolitan areas where they can distribute stuff from and get to consumers more quickly. So I think that um, Amazon looks at more of a distribution strategy versus building physical retail locations. But they do have, again, the Amazon Go locations, which I find inter interesting. It's just not a big part of their business moving forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one question is that we've obviously seen that health and wellness um, have kind of come to the forefront of people's minds yeah. in the pandemic. So how do you really see that industry kind of evolving in a post-COVID world? I think health and wellness, and it, it was on this way heading into the pandemic. In 2019, we saw a huge increase in organic foods, plant-based meats, um, now we're just seeing an acceleration of that trend where consumers are just much more conscious of their health after seeing a pandemic roar through their their communities and i think you know whether it's um in the immunity space and the vitamin space where consumers are much more likely to take vitamins moving forward in the at-home fitness and exercise space or in a plant-based meat space um or even in home cooking i think all those categories stand to really benefit from these changes definitely um so you know with, with the rise of the likes of amazon um, you know, we've seen that more money is kind of going to these larger players. What do you think is going to happen really with the small businesses, the mom and pop shops across, uh, you know, Main Street America? What's going to really happen to them, um, especially as they're competing against the heavy pricing um, that comes from an Amazon? I think they're going to need to reinvent themselves. I think there's room for a bakery that makes incredible uh, cupcakes that there's a cult following for or a company that makes vegan ice cream, you know, a local business. I don't necessarily think there's as much room for a hardware store that makes money selling hammers and nails, um, you know, and, and duct tape, because I think consumers would much likely just get that uh, from Amazon. So I think you really need to make an experience, really need to differentiate um, in ways that Amazon can in order for it to make sense for you to, you know, win in retail. It's no longer just about the product or service that you sell. It's about the experience you're giving the consumers. And those are things just like how Warby does it online with their try-ons. What's the physical manifestation of that? Definitely here. Um, this is kind of a, maybe a difficult question here, but do you think consumers and general populations understand the value and power of serendipity in their lives? So I know you talked a lot about um, those kind of experiences and chance encounters there, but do you think we, we're really valuing that? I think that if you 
had a conversation with a consumer who got married because they met somebody at a bar. And if you told them, if you showed up 20 minutes later, you would have a whole different family and maybe be living somewhere differently. They would understand the value of serendipity. So I think while the word on its own might not carry value, I think if you storytell and contextualize the right, the right way, it certainly will. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so next question here is regarding um, kind of eating at home and snacking and all that. I know we've talked about that extensively in our family. Yeah. But um, do you have some kind of insights into how that culture is starting to really shift there? I think that's very much pandemic related. I think when people are stuck home more, they're sna they snack more. And especially kids. Kids are home more. Kids aren't going to the same amount of Little League games. They're not going to school. They weren't in summer camp. So when kids are home more, there's snacks around the house. And I think when kids can be out of the house more, they'll probably less snacks around the house. So I think that's something that's more pandemic related than anything else. Definitely. And I think it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, one of the questions here is regarding the fact that a lot of people, when they're going grocery shopping, they're buying those impulse purchases like maybe a candy bar or Oreos or something like that. But when you're really doing, uh, you know, you're stepping into an Amazon fresh kind of environment, you don't really have that type uh, of moment where you're kind of just picking something up there. So yeah. how do you yeah. think this is really going to happen as we as we start to move away from in-person grocery store to the impulse? Well, I think it puts, a lot of, it puts a lot of pressure on that category. We talked about during the Halloween webinar, um, the state of California recently um, pushed through legislation where you cannot have certain types of candy bars at the checkout aisle. So it's where those impulse purchases are. Um, and that's obviously a huge, um, you know, channel for these, for companies in the candy category. Uh, obviously there's no such checkout aisle in Amazon. So I think that's why you're seeing a lot of companies in the space going to D to C, they're going to direct to consumer, they're trying to get subscription-based services. The companies in that category are gonna have to reinvent themselves in terms of their distribution uh, based upon those changes. Definitely. Um, kind of the next question I have for you. So in one of your slides, you had talked about how some people will miss in-person shopping even more than their families uh, this holiday. Do you have a little bit more insight into kind of your thinking behind that, that comment there? I think it's nostalgia. I think that it's tradition. I think going to the, going to the um, you know, shopping mall over Thanksgiving weekend is tradition. And I think people equate it with the holiday spirit. And I think that's what they miss more than anything else. I think that's really what they're referring to, in my opinion. Uh, definitely there. Um, so another question here for you is, um, do you think there's going to be a point where consumers will be overwhelmed with all these, uh, you know, like pluses, so like Walmart Plus, Amazon Prime Plus, and that's of this thing? Like at some point, there are a million different memberships for all these different things. Like where do you yeah. see that kind of evolving? Well, we're already starting to see it happen. I mean, uh, Netflix just recently announced that they're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in you know, new subscribers because there's so much choice. You know, uh, NBC's Peacock came out with a streaming service. HBO Max is out. There's Hulu, there's Amazon. So over time, it's going to become a consolidated space and, and the winners are going to be ones who can differentiate. In the case of streaming, Amazon can differentiate because they have an ecosystem, right? They can, they can, you get it for free as long as you get Amazon Prime. So I think the companies that are going to really immerse the consumers in, in value and convenience are going to be the ones that are going to stand, um, stand out. But there is going to be, and I think with Walmart plus and Amazon Prime, consumers are going to just pick one. They probably won't pick both. Um, and I think that will likely happen. But there will be a shakeout for sure. Definitely. Um, so, you know, we, we continue to get a lot of questions about Suzy and kind of what Suzy is. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how some brands are really utilizing a platform like Suzy. Yep. You got it. So there's two sides to Suzy. There is a consumer panel. We have over a million U.S. consumers that are on a gamified mobile application called CrowdTap that you can download from the iOS store or the Android store. Consumers who use the CrowdTap app are able to answer questions that are, that are given to them anonymously uh, from a host of different companies. And they answer questions a variety of different forms and earn points, which they can instantly redeem for digital uh, gifts, whether it be a Spotify membership or an Amazon gift card or what have you. Uh, the, what sits on top of the CrowdTap platform and the CrowdTap audience of a million people is a piece of software called Suzy. Suzy is accessed by over 250 uh, large and small enterprise customers that license the tool to enable them to ask questions to any consumer at any time or any group of consumer, I should say, for instant feedback 
Uh, so it's really instant on-demand market research. So you can be on a Zoom call and wanting to know um, which design or which copy consumers like best, and not just any consumer, but the consumers that matter, target them, ask them a question. And while you're on that Zoom call, you see the results come in. So it really is disintermediating the market research process, putting you, the company, um, and the asker directly in touch um, with the respondent or the teller, if you will, and allow you to aggregate all those answers um, to actually come up with insights or knowledge that allows you to make better, more informed decisions. Definitely. Um, great points there, Matt. And I think, um, obviously, we, we made a big announcement today in terms of Suzy Live uh, and adding that to our Suzy kind of ecosystem. I'd love for you to tell a little bit of the audience of kind of, um, you know, how that works and what that is. Yep. So um, Suzy Live is basically just an extension of what we've been doing. It's just another form to extract insights and, and feedback from consumers. The only difference is instead of asking consumers to answer a question, uh, you can ask a certain sub-segment of consumers to jump on a video call and actually on demand be able to talk to consumers and carry on in-depth interviews with individuals to go even deeper down the research funnel. Uh, and it's just a natural extension of what we're doing. Obviously right now, in-person focus groups are not uh, you know, allowed and available for most companies. And we think that might be a long-term trend in our industry. And it's something that we intend to take advantage of on behalf of our clients. Definitely. Um, Matt, next question for you. So from your kind of insight, if malls are starting to slowly die, um, what do you think will really replace them as a physical venue for discovery, browsing, uh, serendipity, and kind of consumerism overall? Entertainment. So I think whether it's, you know, a platform like Topgolf that allows people to rent a bay where they can go golfing um, in a luxury based experience where they can have, you know, food or iPick, which is a luxury based um you know, a uh, um, movie theater experience. When I say luxury based, doesn't mean it's unaffordable to anybody. It means that it's just something that's premium. Because if you can, you, if you're just going to go to a regular golf shooting range, you probably wouldn't, you, you'd look at it more about golfing. So it's about taking activities that people love doing and basically overlaying it with an experience that connects them with other people drives that serendipity. So I think a lot of malls are going to start to use their venues as a way to drive experience. And I think brands that sell stuff could do that as well. The Apple store is an experience, right? They, they teach classes there. They have a genius bar where you can fix it at the Apple stores and their success has always been just as much about the experience as it is to, to, to offer consumers a physical way they can buy an iPad. Right. And I think every company needs to look at their stores or their retail footprint as a way to give consumers an experience to immerse them in your, in your brand. And I think that's what you're going to start to see more so uh, with malls than just traditional retailers like the gap. If you ever want to ask me questions directly, I'm going to throw my uh, my information up on the screen for a second so you guys can screenshot it if you want. Um, but you can very easily just uh, contact me at any time and uh, via email, I'm happy to answer any question I can um, and just add value. We really just appreciate people taking their time today uh, you know, to see what we have to say and where we think the world's going. And, and we're just you know, really... Um, quite fortunate that you guys have uh, taken the time. But thank you guys very much. Um, again, you can email me at any time, uh, mattb at suzy.com and uh, we'll be in touch real soon. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.